I'm Aaron Roy from the Discover team. Um, how this works, and hi, Waylon, I see you over there. Um, how this works is Waylon's going to be discussing, uh, you know, all the beautiful parts of his workshop and, and really some of his lessons to this group over the next 30 to 45 minutes. Um, but really, you know, he, he's told me, and I see he's, he's waved a second ago, but we really encourage putting the different questions you have in the chat. This is meant to be interactive. You know, Q&A is, is, is something we're going to be reserving time for at the end and, and sharing a bit about his workshop. So as you have questions, you don't have to wait to the end. Feel free to put them in the chat. You know, anything we find that we want to surface earlier, I'm going to feel free to chime in. But questions are encouraged. And if anything, you know, the more the merrier. Um, with that said, Waylon, I would love to kick it over to you. You know, please start with a bit about your background for all these folks who might be new to joining you today, uh, and then we're looking forward to hear it. Yeah, uh, thank you. I can't, so I can't see the questions in the chat, right? You're gonna- No, nope, no, nope, I got it, yep. Great, so yeah, everyone uh, say where in the world you're from, and um, you know, let me know, let Aaron know at any time if you have a question or a comment or you, uh, want me to go deeper into something or you're bored and want me to skip ahead. So I uh, am a writer. I wanted, you know, from a very young age to be a writer. Uh, not totally sure why. Um, and I very quickly saw the challenge. I grew up pretty poor. I saw the challenge of being a writer and making a living doing so. So Eventually, I created a platform for writers and for readers, of course, and that's Elephant Journal. It's one of the largest independent media sites remaining. Um, you know, uh, it's sort of we're in a world, if any of you have seen Social Dilemma, run by major big tech social media. So, you know, I encourage all of you to write on Elephant, check it out. We uh, tell a lot of personal stories. We share views, facts, opinions. Um, we are pretty uh, dedicated to being a benefit. We have millions of readers a month and you can write on it for free instantly. We uh, run a fair amount of online learning around ethics, uh, sharing your uh, story, writing your heart out as we call it, finding your voice. And all of that is uh, with, with Teachable and it's been a wonderful experience so far. So I'm honored and happy to uh, be here today. Um, so thank you to Teachable for making this uh, our online learning possible. Um, a lot of us like to complain about tech and our phones and all this, but the fact that, you know, from my living room, especially these days with COVID, um, we can reach millions of readers a month and host online learning all over the world instantly, uh, affordably, is, you know, there's a little magic in that. I always say, back in 2000 or whenever the first Harry Potter books were coming out, it was considered magic to have a moving picture in a newspaper. That is what a blog is. So we are in a magical time. We just have to use that magic as in Harry Potter or Tolkien or whatever for good. So um, to jump in, should I jump ahead into the writing? Into what we're actually talking about? Yeah, let's uh, share your, your slides and right. we can hop into that. So I wanted today to be, you know, free and to be in offering uh, on how to write, how to share your story for um, those who aren't really writers. Um, I don't know if I'm seeing the screen, the uh, slides. Um, so yeah, I don't, I, we're, they're not, we're not seeing the slides yet, but there they are. There Perfect. we go. Full screen that. Yeah, there you go. Awesome. So today. And, and just uh, kill the Zoom chat. Right. We good? Perfect. Perfect. All right. Some of this, this is sort of like uh, Star Trek Enterprise. Some of this is being run by the, the elephant team. So we're a little bit, uh, we haven't done some of these teachable intros. Um, but uh, yeah, I wanted today to be for people who aren't really writers. Um, it can be for writers as well. But all of us, you know, the real thrust of elephant is people's stories, not writers' stories. So Everything I'm going to talk about today to teach, to discuss, if you have comments or questions, is for anyone. And that doesn't um, mean that there aren't great writers and that there isn't a craft to it. It's just really about finding your voice. And that's something as human beings we all kind of need to do. If we go through life not knowing who we are or what our voice is, um, we're just kind of going to go along with the herd or 
be overwhelmed. Um, and especially in these crazy times, if we can find our voice and, um, you know, be a benefit, connect with others, uh, that's, that's a superpower. So, um, let's see. So how to get started. Getting started as a writer is everything. Um, almost everything with writing, you can figure out on your own, you can figure out with the community. Um, the one thing you really can't uh, do is, or fake, is starting. So you got to sit down. You got to spend five minutes writing. Um, it's kind of like reading a book. You can buy all the books you want at your local independent bookshop, hopefully. But if you don't open them up and read, you're just buying books. So you got to start. So my recommendation is don't dream for 20 years or whatever of writing a novel and think about titles and think about being a famous author or whatever your dreams of writing are. Just do it a little bit every day. Kind of like dishes. Again, they won't do themselves. You just got to sit down and write. And the cool thing is when you actually write, then all the challenges present themselves. Kind of like in Indiana Jones, suddenly you have to get over the crazy rope bridge and over the crocodiles and the rolling ball is coming at you. So we'll talk about some of those obstacles. But the main thing with writing is to just keep at it five minutes a day. If you take a day off, no big deal. If you take two days off, don't take two days off, just do it. Um, and five minutes doesn't need to be that long. And it doesn't need to be about anything profound. It can be about, you know, you could walk down to a, a park or a stream or a mall or a you know, a busy intersection or a quiet intersection. It really doesn't matter where you go and just write what you see. Jack Kerouac called that sketching. Just sketch, just write. Um, Emily Dickinson, a lot of writers talked about this. Just write what you see. The best thing to do um, when you're starting is to avoid cliche uh, because cliche will create a lot of bad habits and won't take you anywhere good. We'll touch on that a little bit more in a minute. So, yeah, I encourage you to kind of forget the dream. The dreams can inspire you, maybe, to become a writer or to write. But I know I've spent a lot of my time putting energy into what would my, the cover of my book look like instead of um, right, actually doing it. So the most important thing is starting. Um, and again, you don't need anyone like me telling you anything, really. If you start and if your eyes are open, your ears are open, you'll figure out your way forward. Uh, community does help, however. Teachers do help, but those are secondary. The first thing to do is start and listen to yourself. And if you run into the dreaded writer's block or some obstacle, again, we'll touch on that in a minute. So the emphasis, again, is a lot of you may not want to be famous writers. You may want to be a better writer for your work or for your studies. Uh, whatever it is, uh, all of us are writing all the time. We're texting, we're emailing, we're on, you know putting up our status on Facebook or Twitter or, or Instagram. Uh, we're writing, we're communicating all the time. And even if we have no ambition to be a writer, and you happen to be here anyway, um, if you're texting your loved one or your family member, your partner, your children, your best friends, if you could communicate more clearly, also in person, it's not just writing, once you've found your voice, if you can communicate clearly and without um, a whole lot of extra baggage, that's a powerful life skill. So how to uncover your voice, not just as a writer, but as a human being. Uh, the, the main thing, and I've already touched on it, is the wisdom isn't out here. You know, you can read books, you can find writing teachers or life teachers, life coaches, mentors, all that is helpful. But the main thing is your voice is right here. You've, you've had it all along. It's not some magic static thing. It, you, you were born with it and it grows and it develops and it changes over time. So it's right here. I remember, I think it was, um, this may be a cliche actually, but there was a story about an Alaskan sculptor, uh, a native Alaskan sculptor who said, you know, their craft was simply to uncover everything that um, was already there. So they weren't creating a sculpture, they were uncovering. They were just getting rid of everything that wasn't the sculpture. That's kind of the same process as finding your voice. And 
you know, I grew up in the Buddhist tradition. That's basically what Buddhism communicates is we have basic goodness. We become selfish. Neurosis arises when we're, when we view happiness or whatever we want as finite, but fundamentally we have goodness and we are fundamentally good. And we just have to kind of relax and get back to that. So writer's block. Uh, I love writer's block. A lot of people have uh, strategies. If you go to YouTube or Nano Remo or whatever it is um, about how to get through writer's block or how to get around writer's block or how to defeat writer's block. I think that's, um, I mean, I would dare say I know that is the wrong approach. Writer's block is something that we all experience. So there's something uh, about it that's common to the human experience at, when we try to communicate. And that's um, interesting because it's not just something some of us experience. I think, you know, the only ones of us who don't experience it are the ones of us who don't fight it. And I haven't fought it for years. When I'm writing and I run into uh, what is my voice, what is my story, I don't like what I'm writing, this is awful, I had these huge dreams, that's why I really say, you know, some people say kill your darlings, I find that a little aggressive. It's more like, you know, be nice to your darlings, but don't invest all of your energy in them. And the notion of kill your darlings is you have these precious, exciting ideas, get rid of them. It's not quite that for me. It's more like writer's block is saying, hey, you're going in the wrong direction. So writer's block to me is like a best friend. And you wouldn't want to get through your best friend, defeat your best friend, jump around your best friend, trip your best friend, kill your best friend. You want to listen to your best friend and they are saying, what you're doing isn't genuine. It's not working. Hold up. So if you come, come back, instead of paying attention to the symptoms or the problems out here, which is writer's block, you come back and you say, what am I trying to communicate? What's my story? What's helpful for others? What's helpful for me? And you just come back to that. If you keep coming back to that, you'll find your way forward. And it might be like walking, you know, with your eyes closed down a long um, hallway or something. You know, you're going to have a lot of stops and starts. And that's where- Raylan. If, if yeah. I may share a question from the audience, you know, the, Andrea asked, does, does this also apply to nonfiction? Can you speak a bit about that? Well, yeah, I mean, it depends what kind of nonfiction. A lot of popular nonfiction uses the tools of fiction. So fundamentally, we want to tell a good story. Even if you're writing an essay, um, Andrea uh, or Aaron, um, you know, you want to communicate in a way where people hear it and where you yourself feel genuine and feel present with whatever you're telling. You don't want it to feel like a lie. You don't want to feel like a trick. So in some ways, fiction is actually harder because you kind of are telling not a lie, but you're making some stuff up. So yeah, I would say it applies equally. Well, that's a great question. And any questions anyone has, please stop me. Um, so yeah, writer's block is just telling you that you're going in the wrong direction and you need to listen. I mean, a lot of what a writer does isn't just communicate, it's listening. So you're listening to kind of, you're getting feedback. Again, if you're going down that hallway and you can't see, um, you're getting feedback. Oh, here's a wall, here's an entry, which way do I go? So up here is the first rules of writing. I wrote a slightly longer thing. It basically repeated again and again and again. Um, just, you know, say what you want to say. Don't overthink it. Just say what you want to say. You can edit later. You can live edit, which is something we teach in our teachable course, live editing, kind of like more like jazz where you're editing while you're writing it. That's something all of us do, but how to do that without stopping the flow is kind of a trick. Um, don't overthink it, just say what you want to say. So you have to really ask yourself, and again, that's where listening is important. Ask yourself, what is it that I want to say? And keep listening to that. How, who do I want to communicate with? Who do, how do I want to connect? And so there's two different things going on, right? There's your story, there's you, there's your voice. And then you also have to keep the audience in mind. But the main thing here is, in terms of the first rule of writing, get started, write five minutes a day. If you miss a day, no big deal. Don't miss two days in a row. Just write it all out.
don't be obsessed with how it sounds. So in basketball, when I used to play basketball, they would say in practice, it doesn't matter whether you make it or not at all. It doesn't matter if it sounds good when you're writing it. Don't over obsess about it. Don't judge it while you're writing it. All that matters in basketball was the form, right? Have good form. So in terms of writing, just sit down, make sure you're writing and just say what you want to say. That's all that matters. Later, or with live editing, then you can work on how it actually sounds, how it lands, how it communicates. And even when you're doing the rough draft, the first draft, you want to keep the audience in mind always. But you have to be grounded in your story and in your voice, so you're not just performing. It has to be genuine. So, yeah, everyone agonizes, stresses out, runs into writer's block when they're first starting. Again, if you just sit down and sketch for five minutes a day, you'll get through that. Writer's block is a wall of fire. It's not actually that intimidating if you can just stay at it gently a little bit. You'll get through it. Or you won't get through it. You'll, you'll listen to it, but you won't, it won't be an obstacle. And, you know, don't get overly attached to what you're writing. Um, if you write something beautiful, you, yeah, sure, you can keep it. But, um, you know, it's all coming from your voice. So you have an endless supply of beautiful writing or beautiful communicating within you. You really do. The main thing is finding that font, finding that, that golden goose. So, yeah, we kind of went over this already. But writer's block is just saying whatever you're trying to do is not natural. It's not working. And don't bully me. Writer... Writer's block is a good friend. It will not go away because you're telling it to shut up. It will demand to be listened to. Um, and yeah, you know, I like to say you're not a writer if you're not writing. That sounds harsh and it's, it's almost intentional. I don't want to be harsh, but I, you know, you're not a fisherman or a fisher person if you're not fishing. Um, you might be generally a fisher person, but um, if you're not doing it, you're not doing it. So is kind of like, I think it's, they said it about actors or something. You're only as great as your last play. Uh, you're only as great as your last song. You're only as great as your, so it's not about greatness particularly, but, you know, being a writer is an active verb. It's not just a noun. So let's see. I think that's probably enough on writer's block. Um, how to write things people actually want to read. Um, you know, there are two parts of it. You first have to be grounded in your voice. And second, you have to be willing to kind of make eye contact with your audience. And your audience often will be invisible. So that's why writing with Elephant or Instagram or something like that can help. It helps to have a live community reacting. Um, here I talk about, in this slide, I talk about, I'm not a huge fan of inspiration. Inspiration comes, inspiration goes. It's kind of like wind. If you're sailing, you got to have another method to go forward. Rowing, a motor um, is wonderful when you have it, but anyone here who is a parent or who is working on their, um, you know, doctor, doctor's the thesis or who is a friend, you can't just show up when you're inspired to show up. You got to show up all the time. Parents know this, friend, true friends know this. Um, Entrepreneurs know this. You got to show up even when things are hardest. If you're working out, you know this. If you're running, you know this. So inspiration is fickle. You're not just looking for that. What again you're looking for isn't perfection, isn't fame, isn't inspiration. It's your voice. Once you have that, you can be genuine all the time and you can write unconditionally. In fact, writing when, when times are hard becomes almost the most delicious thing. You can communicate your obstacles in a way that are helpful and connect with other folks. So let's see. And uh, again, I can't see your comments right now. So if this is, is this interesting? Is this good? Ask some questions. I'm here for you, literally. So in terms of the audience, you know, again, it's important, especially if you're 
Well, I was going to say, especially if you're introverted, but it's almost especially if you're extroverted or introverted, you don't want to get lost in the audience. The audience comes second, but it's a close second. First, you have to find your voice, be grounded in your story, then connect with the audience. So I really keep the audience in mind for everything because I want to make everything accessible. No tree fort passwords, as I like to call it. No uh, in-speak, no in-jokes. Everything needs to be um, accessible. Um, if you're blogging, obviously you can link a word or a name, something people may not understand, to more information. So that's a great gift, and that can kind of speed the flow of your writing. Um, in terms of marketing, in terms of finding a huge audience, um, that takes a bunch of things, which we teach also on Elephant Academy, on Teachable, um, which is our online school on Teachable. Um, and that it takes a bunch of things and I list all of them, but one of them is consistency, one of them is interaction, and one of them is understanding that you're not marketing. I really hate it when people, even marketers, talk about marketing. You're trying to connect with people genuinely. Nobody wants to give you their money for whatever it is you're marketing, but they, they may be interested in what you're offering and be willing to pay for it. So if you just treat everyone like a human being, not a user or a consumer, I think you'll actually make more money, build a better and more resilient, more genuine and more fun community. Um, so there's a little bit more here about our voice. Our voice isn't special. Um, it is unique and you are special and your voice is special, but it's not special in the sense that it's, when you find it, it's just an ordinary thing. My Buddhist teacher, uh, my parents' Buddhist teacher would often say meditation should just be like brushing your teeth. It's not some big spiritual holy act, it's just an ordinary thing. So it is an ordinary thing, just like having an arm or having a nose. It's kind of magical that you have a nose, but we're also, you know, it's pretty ordinary as well. So just use it, find it, and share it. Um, writing with specificity under the light bulb, that is everything. If you can avoid cliche, you will find your voice again and again and again and again. Um, be specific, be specific. I do writing exercises in Elephant Academy. People always start with cliche. I fell in love with this amazing girl or boy and everything was amazing. My whole life transformed and then we broke up and I was so brokenhearted and you know, it took me years to, none of that lands. No one hears any of that, even though it's really powerful stuff. So if you can get specific, talk about where you lived, how you met, you know, how you fell in love, how you broke up, get specific, then people get invested. Ernest Hemingway did that as a challenge once. I think he was challenged to write a six word story or something. And he did it very specifically. It was something like, you know, a, a baby's shoe, um, brand new in it, and it was being sold somehow. And it communicated that, wow, someone's infant had died and they were selling this brand new unused shoe. And that's heartbreaking in six words. He did it in six words. I can't remember exactly what it was. So the more details you offer, the more clear your voice will be. And the less you'll be marketing and the more you'll be connecting and communicating. So, you know, now we get to the fun part, I guess, which is that this can actually be a benefit. When you find your voice, you can share who you are and what you've gone through. Um, and it can actually be a benefit to this world. It can actually help this world. It can help yourself. It can help everyone who reads it. And that can apply to products. That can apply to communities. That can apply to anything. But if you're selling something, you have to work all the harder to be genuine and to come back to your voice. Um, so this is everything. Imagine if you could find out who you were be yourself, see your own confusion with wisdom and with empathy, share that, bravely share that with some sense of vulnerability, not making it look perfect. And others could read it, be inspired by it, grow up themselves and be a benefit, benefit to their communities. It's just good upon good upon good. Um, and on a practical level, they will be in love with the community or the words that you have created and whatever you're offering. And hopefully what you're offering is a benefit as well. Okay. Um, yep. 
Yeah. So just more, I'm reading my notes here, just more about keeping it real. And it's so simple, but um, if you're, if you're kind of putting too many exclamation marks in there and trying to get people to click a link and trying to get people to buy stuff, you got to come back to yourself. You've lost yourself. You know, Steve Jobs often said he created products for his friends and his family. He didn't try to make them appeal to everybody. And ironically, that's kind of what made them appeal to a lot of everybody is that they were very specifically created for specific problems and functions. So if you can create a real community, as we've done with Elephant on Twitter, on Instagram, on Elephant itself, on Facebook with 12 million fans, is it's a lot of work. And, you know, you kind of hate social media as you're doing it, but the people you connect with and their willingness to support whatever you're doing, as long as it's a benefit, is immense. And it's a huge gift in your life. And even if you're doing it small for your texting, for your emailing, for your job, for your family, for your own writing, all these lessons hopefully apply. And if your audience is only yourself, that's okay. I do encourage people to share it with others so it can be a benefit. But writing for yourself is also powerful. So in terms of um, social media disagreement, obviously we're in vitriolic times. Um, you know, it's important to not view it as a soapbox. So I often will practice DMing people who are being jerks or who are attacking or trolling. I practice DMing them and whatever I would say there is less performancy and less aggressive usually. And then I put that as the comment. So basically treat everyone kindly, but also be honest. So it's a combination of those two. You don't need to be rolled over, but you also um, can really try to bring the best out of people. It's fine to block people. It's fine to uh, be honest with people if they're being jerks about that, but you want to try to be constructive and kind. Um, and then people will disagree, uh, but they'll respect you as long as you're being respectful. And often you'll find some commonality. Um, so that's just a little bit on comments, interaction. It's a lot of time. It's a total bummer. Social media will, you know, suck your life dry. Uh, so you have to view what you're doing as a benefit and, and uh, service. Otherwise, you know, the fact that there's not a lot of, of it, uh, in it, in it for you can be draining sometimes. Um, so I guess final notes here, as you can see, you can write on elephantjournal.com slash post. Um, we'll share it to millions uh, outside of your choir and you can share it as well. Write on your own website, write in your own journal, um, five minutes a day. Doesn't have to be a big thing. Um, don't give all of your work and your writing to Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or whatever. Um, use them to accomplish whatever you're trying to accomplish and to be a benefit, but try not to be used by them. Um, and that goes into how much time you put there. I recommend social media uh, limits you can put on your phone. Um, and then, yeah, if you wanna join Elephant Academy, we have, I think, six different courses. We have one huge live course um, and it's uh, supportive, loving, fun. It really is, and challenging, it's not easy community, but you will, it's kind of like going through a, a holy car wash. Like you will not come out looking the same. You will be a different person when you go through the academy. And that's because you are focusing on finding your voice and being a benefit. So thank you so much. In, in Wayland, but as we get ready for Q and A, um, you know, we would like, as someone who has struggled to, to write myself um, and, and the, having looked at the Elephant Academy and been able to see some of those courses, um, while folks put a few more questions in the Q and A, because I already see we have a few queued up. Can can you share a bit more? You know, like it's especially for folks who are struggling to even get to that five minutes a day and just yeah. finding that rhythm and routine. Can you share a bit about your course and and bridging that gap? Because it is hard to build that into your routine if you don't have that muscle. Totally. I mean, it's hard for me. You know, the biggest the biggest obstacle to writing isn't writer's block in my mind. It's the word busy. I, I'm busy. You know, there's all these kind of, this, there's this alternative 
Aaron Roy or Waylon Lewis or whatever, living an alternative life who is reading a lot and writing and probably gardening more and maybe cooking more. And, you know, there's this alternative like parallel universe us who isn't bothered by busy and is doing all the meaningful things. And then there's real world us where we're busy and we're caught up and we're wasting time on social media and we're, you know, laying around watching five hours of Walking Dead or whatever. So, you know, the main thing is to just really, again, come back to your voice and say, is writing something I want to do? And if it's not, don't guilt trip yourself about it. Is reading, is gardening, is cooking. Find out what you really want to do and you'll find joy doing them. And if you don't find joy doing them, find something else. In terms of Elephant Academy, yeah, I, I guess I forgot to talk about what we do. Um, and I guess I'm sort of walking my talk in that sense, that, um, in that, you know, you don't need to over market what you do. If people are into it or attracted by you trying to be of service, which was my approach here, hopefully they'll be magnetized to go further. But Elephant Academy kind of grew out of our intern program, ironically. We, we um, had a really good intern program in person when we were a physical magazine, which we were for six years. And then we put so much training and time into this internship. Eventually, we said it's just not worth it. And we got to offer it, you know, as a class. And tons of people signed up. And, you know, Teachable uh, has really made it possible to reach way beyond even our own choir. And so it's generally like a kind of two week program, maybe a little or a two month program, a little less like eight weeks, six to eight weeks, depending how you count it. And there's like 118 people I think are doing it right now from all over the world, every time zone. We all come together for live videos, lectures, Q&A, kind of like this, um, but probably more interaction the whole time um, once a week. And if you can't attend because of the time zone or you're busy, uh, your work, you can watch the recording. Then we have a whole LMS, which is on Teachable, the whole kind of curriculum with quizzes, with slides like this, with videos, with resources. Here's how to build up your Instagram. Here's how to, um, you know, publish a book, all this stuff. And then, um, and we have other courses for those specifically as well. And then um, we have a big group uh, which is largely on Facebook, although also on Teachable, uh, for people to actually interact, share their articles, people get to publish on Elephant with specific attention of mentors and our um, Elephant editors, uh, who will do up to two edits of your piece for you, which is not something we do for everyone else. And um, yeah, I think, you know, for many years, the Elephant Academy folks we also pay our top writers at Elephant generally. So a lot of the Elephant Academy people wind up publishing, being successful with all the attention, getting paid, making more money than they spent on the Academy. So it's kind of a, it's like not just, you're not just studying to be a farmer or something, you're actively farming and getting the fruits of your labor back during the Academy. Incredible. Uh, yeah, like it's a, a flywheel of, of investment into the community and, and back into the writing. Uh, and that's a wonderful thing. Um, with that, you know, we do have a few different questions. Uh, and folks, you know, we have about 20 minutes left. So if there's any other questions that come up as follow up to some of the things Waylon says, feel free to post it. I'm going to keep grabbing them as, as long as I see them in there. Um, but first up, you know, journaling versus writing a story. How does one practice their voice uh, doing the two or between the two? Um, what's the difference with journaling or writing a story? I, I, I think that's the question. And if, and if I'm phrasing this wrong, I apologize to the chat. Feel free to tell me I'm wrong and I'll, I'll repeat it back to Waylon. But I think no, that's yeah. the question. Yeah. So I think they're just kind of different muscles. I think journaling is the best thing you could ever do if you're trying to find your voice. Um, but then after you journal for a while, it's kind of like the Zen koan does, a. Uh, tree falling in a forest make a sound if no one's around to hear it. On some level, writing is this beautiful musical instrument that you want to share with others. You don't want to just hoard it for yourself. So journaling is a fantastic thing. If you're going through a lot, if you're trying to find your voice, journaling is your voice. I mean, there's nothing fake about it. As long as you really keep it private, don't do a journal for you and a couple people. Do a journal just for you. Not because it's so secret or you're telling you know, exciting stuff, but just you're not performing. 
But then if you can learn to extend that to others um, and keep that voice and always, and once you identify that voice, you can come back to it again, again, and again. Just like in basketball, I talked about having the right form. No matter what your shot is, you're in a chaotic game, you can come back to that form. And then writing, sorry, and then writing a story, um, you know, we talk a lot about catharsis, which is kind of a fancy word for I'm going through all this stuff, good or bad. And then this magical alchemy happens when you talk about it and people connect with it. You're suddenly relieved of the sort of pressure around it. And it's actually a benefit to others. So it's very exciting when you write for others. Got it. And if there's any follow-up questions off that, feel free to put them in the chat. I'll, I'll make sure it comes up. Another one that I've always wondered, so thank you for asking it, is uh, do you have to read a lot to become a better writer? You know, it, can you share a bit about that? Yeah, that's sort of a uh, cliche about writing. It's like the best way to become a writer is to read a lot. And, you know, a lot of cliches are cliches because they're true. Um, yes, Right, read, 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 and you will fall in love with some writers. I fell in love with very ordinary writers with very ordinary accessible voices. So that's kind of where I am magnetized. Um, you know, Maya Angelou, Michael Pollan, um, Malcolm Gladwell, uh, Thoreau, like writers who are very accessible in how they write. I have a disdain for uh, writers who are very complex and kind of tricky and you're like, what does it mean? Um, I don't find that that interesting. I find that kind of selfish. Um, that said, there are exceptions. Um, I loved Kerouac because of his heart, um, even though he wrote very creatively uh, and densely. And he really, he wrote like it was music. So it wasn't always that accessible or, or um, direct, but I, I fell in love with it. Thank you. I mean, <laughs> that helps me even think through it because I'm you know, always looking for more things to write and, and trying to understand, you know, how my voice fits against those. Yeah. Uh, another question was, you know, it, from this from Julie, any tips on how to define your audience um, so you can keep your audience in mind when reading? You know, any exercises you do? Can you maybe yeah. share a bit about that? That's such a great question because so a lot of people will say, I am writing for a demographic. I am writing for 55-year-old you know, um, men, women, blah, 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 who live here, who maybe are interested in X. And that's fine. And that's valid. And it's um, common sense. I try specifically to write for everyone. Uh, I try to write for people might disagree with me. I try to write for my grandma. I try to write for, um, you know, to be accessible enough that a child could read most of it. Um, Obviously, there are certain topics that aren't interesting or appropriate for every single demographic ever. But, you know, I think you can choose. You can say, I want to write for, I'm writing a cooking book, a vegan cooking book for vegans who care about getting more protein. And that can be your audience. Um, to me, if I wrote a vegan cooking book, it would be, I want to write a vegan cooking book for vegans, as well as busy people parents who only have five minutes, as well as people who like are really into cooking, uh, as well as people who think vegan food is stupid. I want to write for everybody. Um, so you can kind of decide if you want to, it's kind of like giving a speech. I think that's the way I approach it is you visualize that you're up on a stage and you're talking to an audience. Is the audience a tight community, almost like a book club, or is the audience more just whoever showed up and paid eight bucks to come to whatever event you're doing. And I kind of prefer that generally. So I guess the answer is it's up to you, but it's important to kind of visualize that and be clear about it. Great question. Great. Um, and, and another one, and this is, this looks like someone who's already written, um, they're got ready at least to write an elephant journal. Um, so this is from Eliza. And the, the question is, she's, I think she's written some pieces. She's thought of submitting them to elephant journal, but that she's held back. Um, any thoughts on what is most sought after or, you know, how best to self-edit and, and get over that, that hurdle? Yeah, um, we get that a lot. People are like, oh, I have these ideas. I've been sitting on them for two years. You know, how do I go forward? Um, and I think, you know, the main thing is to come back to that voice. Like, 
don't worry about how people will like it. Just focus on you and focus on your story. What do you want to share? So instead of thinking, what do elephant readers care about and want to read? Think, what do I care about? And what, what can I share with some sense of authority? And often that's our own experience. You know, if you're not writing a journalistic piece with a lot of investigation and a lot of facts and sources or an essay, you're probably telling a personal story. So if I write about being bullied in junior high, that could be relatable. That could be helpful for other people um, who maybe got bullied or who are parents of someone who got bullied. It could be really, people might really connect with it, but it's my story. So it's not that I'm not saying don't be, I'm not saying be selfish, but it's like, come back to yourself. Worry less about the audience at first and worry more about what do you want to share? Like in Dead Poets Society, there's that great um, moment with Robin Williams who's saying, you know, um, the, the world is like an epic novel or something. What will your paragraph be? So what, what will your paragraph be? And is there a similar question, but if I think this feeds off to it, is, you know, having a hard time knowing what to write about and, and getting past that just to start writing, I think you, you obviously just sort of answered that in that question. Is there anything else you'd want to add? The, the, you know, even prior to having thoughts and getting ready to submit to Elephant Journal, just figuring out you want to write, but you're not sure what to write about. Can, can you just touch on that again for, for that question yes. for the audience? I think like in that question or both of those questions is there's a fear of rejection, you know, which we all have and it's a healthy fear. Um, you know, we have that whether it's like we're trying to find where to sit in junior high and you're walking out in the cafeteria, you're afraid of getting rejected. But um, Elephant won't really reject you. Like we have editors, they may not want, they may reject one of your articles and that could feel like a rejection, but you're welcome to resubmit it. You're welcome to submit a new piece um, every, I feel like it's a uh, talk about cliches. Almost every famous writer has talked about their first manuscript or their second manuscript or whatever got rejected by 14 different publishers. So that's where it helps to have your story and identify your voice. If you're sharing something helpful and genuine, you're not going to let an editor at Elephant or the readers stop you. If you publish something and it's this big moment, and then only 100 people write it, read it ever, including like 20 of your own clicks and your grandma, you know, who cares? Just keep writing because it's a craft. It's not a one-time event. It's a, it's a craft. It's sort of like, you know, if you expected big squash and pumpkins and tomatoes and all this on your first day of gardening, you know, you got you to gotta stay at it. You got to water everything, plant everything, learn from it, talk with friends, make connections. And then at the end of the growing season, you'll have um, some lovely fresh veggies to eat. So, And I think a follow-up question that came off of that was, uh, when it comes to style, what's the best way to find your own style and tone of voice? Uh, specifically, this, this person shared that sometimes they read stuff they write and it, it doesn't even feel like them. Like, it, it, right. if they have anything to add, feel free. Does that make sense? I think that that's where reading is helpful. Um, so when I was young, I read author after author after author. And I would like, basically, it's kind of like music or something. You're like sampling off of all the authors. Like after reading F. Scott Fitzgerald's short stories, I wrote like F. Scott Fitzgerald, but like a pretty bad, mediocre F. Scott Fitzgerald for a month. And then you kind of grow out of that. So that finding your voice is this process of finding people who write or think or share the same way as you and you get inspired by them and it's also finding people who write and share and think differently than you and learning from that by contrast or rejecting that or so that's where reading is helpful um it'll there's certain people who will kind of show you your voice and you can have mentors every author can be a mentor for free just by reading their book great and i, I see folks in the in the chat as well you know putting in some some thoughts to help with that question cool. um another question or at least uh perhaps something for you to comment on is did you did you have anything you wanted to contribute on grassroots versus asking to have an editor see it first or any thoughts around that 
Yeah, so on Elephant, we have two different ways you can submit an article. One is what we call grassroots or instant, and it's basically the same as Instagram or Facebook status or Twitter, where you don't need anyone's permission, you just put it up. And that's my favorite. I don't want anyone editing or touching my piece particularly. I just want to put it up and I don't want to overthink it. And I just want to, boom, done. Then if an editor at Elephant likes it, they will take it, help out the image, help out the title. You know, they'll put it into kind of like a baker. They'll kind of arrange it and package it and put it out uh, for everyone to read. But everyone can read instant. Um, and then, yeah, the other way is to submit it directly to an editor. Then you'll wait two days to seven days for an editor to look at it, uh, accept it, reject it. If they accept it, edit it and post it. Um, I would never do that because I don't want the delay. And um, But yeah, if you, you know, say English is your second language or um, you have a really good relationship with an editor, you may want to submit directly to an editor because they'll work for free. That's the kind of cool thing that Elephant offers is we have 12 editors or whatever who will work for free for you all the time. And that's thanks to our subscribers. They will edit your stuff for free. So. Uh, yeah, and that's, that's incredible. <laughs> I could use an editor on every piece I write. Yeah, um, me, well, me too. So I, yeah. you know, when I say instant, it's not that I don't want an editor, it's that I want to share my voice and then have an editor come in and make sure I didn't misspell the spell exactly uh and, in, and another question um is how should reading as part of research into a particular subject influence one's writing um you know should one aim to incorporate common phrases and seen into one's voice can you share any thoughts around this uh can you explain that one again um you know reading as part of research into a particular subject you know influence one's writing yeah i, I would imagine this is around you know deep research into a particular topic, you know, and if one's doing that, should they aim to incorporate common phrases and scenes from this research in, into their voice back for the audience? Can you, do you have any for thoughts sure. around yeah. that? Yeah, I'm a big believer in like sharing your story. And for that, you know, you need only research your own story, your own life, your own places you've lived. You could do a lot of research. Like I used to live in Vermont. I probably never researched the history of where I lived. You could do that and you know, tell more of a full, interesting story uh, of your own life in that place by doing research. So it could apply to anything, but for sure, um, if you're doing a work of nonfiction or a work of fantasy and you don't, you know, like my friend who works at Elephant uh, has written now two or three fantasy books about dragons and all this stuff. And he's done insane amounts of research just to tell this story accurately and uh, world building. Um, so it can apply to fiction or nonfiction. And yeah, um, I used to love to write essays and those are, of course are all research. Uh, I think sampling, quoting, fair use, uh, it's fantastic. Just always credit everyone who you quote, um, and link, you know, support other writers. That's something I meant to say. That's a huge part of being a writer is buy their books. Don't ask for a discount. If you know them, you know, share their blog on Elephant, share their blog from their website, share their Instagram to your stories, like support writers. And, and really urgently, this is, has nothing to do with what we're talking about, but support independent local bookshops and not Amazon. Right now, Amazon is growing, 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 and local bookshops, local mom and pops all over the world are suffering and, and it's really an existential crisis. So please, uh, you can buy from bookshop.org. That's an online way to support local bookshops um similar to amazon so you can find anything and get it shipped from bookshop.org another question that and i to, to just share with uh to mirror what wayland said i use bookshop.org i love it it's an incredible experience um, i'm so glad i switched i can absolutely say that that is a wonderful recommendation oh. and people it's worth checking out for the next book purchase um, another question from the audience is, you know, Waylon, can you share, you know, any perhaps unknown or, or lesser known writers that inspire you that, you know, you'd, you'd love to share with this group who's watching today? Uh, huh. That's a great question. Um, I think I would, uh, say I can't, I, I think I would say I would have to prepare for that one. Um, by going to, I have huge bookshelves here full of many lesser known writers, but, um, 
what I, I would just turn that back to you guys and, and maybe just in comments go nuts like everyone share one writer who others may not know uh, not a famous writer share a writer in your comments um, if I have 30 seconds I can run over there but um, you know the last 10 years my right my reading has probably been the most boring of my life because I only wanted to be a writer and then I wound up creating a platform for writers and then I wound up being a CEO and then I wound up having to run a business and um, so I've been reading business writers um, and that's not something I was ever interested in before and I would say that by far the best and almost the only mindful business book I've ever found is Bo Burlingham uh, who is a wonderful journalist uh, who wrote small giants about businesses who are trying to do good not just make money and um so i highly recommend that but that's probably not at all what you're asking i am half named after philip whalen who was a very lesser known poet in the beat generation so and they, and they did add a follow-up which was to make it a little easier perhaps like your your top five you know even favorite writers or just i think to distill it down because I think that is hard. There's so many unknown writers I'm sure you could give exposure to. Yeah, I mean, Michael Pollan is one of my favorites. So when I moved back to, in, to Boulder in 1999, I think there was like just a couple farms uh, that were still alive. And, you know, the suburbanization of Colorado was going mad. And there was a farmer's market here, but it was not really seen as a much of a thing. Since Michael Pollan wrote his books, omnivores, dilemma, et cetera, farmers markets have increased by 10,000 times in the US. So do I love his writing? Yeah. Do I love his writing? Yes. Would I love to read anything he ever wrote? Yes. But do I love the effect of his writing more? By far. Um, so I don't view, you know, I think writing can become very selfish and very insular, like, oh, this person is such a beautiful writer, you know? Um, it's like, don't get distracted by the music. Focus on the heart of the message. And I think that should apply to music or anything. So it is both the delivery and the, the heart, but um, I do love writers who have accomplished something helpful. I think Maya Angelou, who I mentioned before, you know, her writing was pure catharsis. I mean, what a story. Um, so painful and so wonderful. Uh, Toni Morrison is another legend in my mind. Mark Twain, um, I adore forever. Um, uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald, when I was young, uh, his ability to, very interestingly, he communicated a lot of vulnerability, a lot of brokenheartedness in men, um, in the male experience, which I found helpful in his women you know, were even known as the Fitzgerald girl. His women were dominant. His women were independent. His women were strong. So wonderful writer in that way. I love things that weren't just straight up like novels or uh, I love biographies. Um, William Manchester I loved. I loved Tintin when I was a kid, comic book. Um, Calvin and Hobbes. You know, you can find amazing art or amazing stories in any form. A lot of you may like graphic novels or something that I don't know about. And so I'd love to hear that too. Um, a wonderful book that's often overlooked is Gift from the Sea by Anne Mara Lindbergh. She does the kind of catharsis that's helpful. It's almost like reading a Buddhist book by a complete, you know, someone who's barely ever heard of Buddhism. Um, wonderful. Pema Chodron, Buddhist author. Um, she's not even really a writer. I think her books are transcribed and edited, but they're from her talks and her voice is so powerful and helpful. So probably really boring suggestions, but I like I like writers who are a benefit. That's what I look for. I mean, I'm taking notes over here. <laughs> <All right. laughs> I'm like, all right, I got to go to bookshop.org and get these ones. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I see folks in, no, I was gonna say, I see folks in the audience sharing some of their favorites as well. So cool. in, in, I see Frederick Bachman, Natalie Jenner. Um, that, that's awesome. Cool. Um, with a few minutes left, we have about a minute or two left, folks. Is there any last questions, uh, you know, anybody wants to put in while we have Waylon here with us? Uh, and in, in the inverse side, Waylon, anything last, any last things you'd love to share with this audience, you know, while we have a few minutes left? Yeah, I mean, I would say uh, I wrote a book called Things I Would Like to Do With You. Um, that was sort of the 
it came out of all those writers who I read and loved and uh, learned from. And it came out of the Buddhist teachings. And I held that up to my kind of relationship life. So it's a book about kind of a new kind of love, one that isn't about codependence, but is about independence and and uh, humor and affection and making friends with loneliness, sort of the Buddhist notion of love. So anyone could check that out. It was also eco-printed, which I think is something authors and writers should talk about more. Printing without plastic. Most book covers, even children's books, are covered in vaguely toxic plastic now. And um, let's print locally on an eco paper. Oh, I just lost your sound, did I? I'm back. Sorry, it was muted. Oh. Um, and, and it looks like some folks in the chat have actually read your book. So, yeah, and I see I see folks saying great book, and that's that, that's what we like to see. But for folks who haven't, as Waylon mentioned, um, you know, with a few seconds left here, anyone who joined late, a replay will be made available after. So, if you if you want to go back, watch any of Waylon's slides, those will be here here for you on the replay, and we're also going to email that out. Additionally, if you're interested in Waylon's course, uh, you know, there's a there should be a button above my head somewhere in this YouTube thing. Um, and if not, we'll also be emailing out a link to that as well. So you can check out his course uh, from the Elephant Academy and, and Wayland's group. Um, you know, with that, everyone in the chat, I would say that let's give Wayland a big thank you because this was wonderful. I learned a bunch of things. I mean, it looks like folks did here. So, you know, thank you so much. That was absolutely yeah, wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, if you have more questions in the future, Wayland's contact information is in there for, for, the, for the group. So feel free to reach out directly to Elephant Academy and, to go from there. Other than that, I'm going to be turning off the... Uh, live stream in a few moments. Thank you again, Will, and that was absolutely incredible. Thank you, Aaron. Yeah, thank you, Teachable, and thank you, everyone, for bothering to come here in your busy day. Thank you.